First, I want to say good afternoon. Thank you for attending. Um, I think that this session will last about 30 minutes. There will be a Q&A at the end. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Pat McCord. I'm the Vice President of Quality at Minko Technology Labs in Austin, Texas. I've got over 30 years of experience in military semiconductor assembly, testing, and qualification. I'm a member of the JEDEC 13.2 committee and have been for 25 years co-chairman of the committee for eight years. I'm also currently the task group chairman for test method 1014 hermeticity testing and method 1018 residual gas analysis and I recently published a white paper on a uh, one-way leak phenomena that has been seen in hermetic cavity packages. The topic of the webinar today is hermeticity or leak testing per these two methods the methods in 883 for fine leak A1, A2, um, conditions B1, B2, and the B2B1 combo test in Krypton 85, and fluorocarbon gross leak. Additionally, we're going to discuss a little bit of 750 condition A, Krypton wet gross leak, and uh, condition B, the dry gross Krypton and Krypton fine. We'll talk about a few of the comparisons of these tests and some of the pitfalls that uh, you come across when you're performing leak tests. So just to start off with the basics, um, the purpose of leak testing is exactly as it sounds. It's to detect large or small leaks in microelectronic packages. Um, those leaks can be the result of assembly, handling, mechanical stress, environmental stress, a number of uh, um, issues. It can even be related to the materials that you're using. Perform leak test. Um, microelectronic parts are very sensitive to um, environment corrosion damage. And when people think about electronics, they think about their cell phone and their laptop and their desktop computer. But we're discussing leaks that would present themselves in military electronics. Um, fighter aircraft, radar systems, flight control systems, um, smart bombs, those type of things where a leak can have a catastrophic failure if it causes the microelectronic part to malfunction. A real world example of that is, um, as an example, you're a pilot and you're in a fighter aircraft, you're ready for launch on the deck of your aircraft carrier sitting in the Persian Gulf and it's summer. Outside it's 100 degrees or more, the electronics of your radar system and your flight controls are up and running and they're generating their own heat and so the in-circuit temperature on those parts can be 160 Fahrenheit or hotter. Also you're at sea level, it's moist and it's salty and you're at one atmosphere. They fire the catapult, you're launched from the aircraft carrier, you're at cruise altitude in less than two minutes. Now the temperature negative 77 degrees Fahrenheit, the air pressure is less than one atmosphere. The plane stays there for a couple hours doing its patrol, it returns to the aircraft carrier. It descends from the very dry, freezing uh, environment that it was in back to that warm, humid, salty air. The parts that are external to the pressure hull of the airplane begin to condense moisture on its surfaces, including the salt and other debris that it may have picked up. And if a leak is present, um, at the next cycle or two, those contaminants and moisture are going to be aspirated in through that leak into the part, contaminate the components, and eventually result in a failure. So a very simple description of leak test is um, parts that need to be tested are placed in a pressure vessel. A vacuum is pulled on the parts for a specified time. The pressure vessel is then either filled with a liquid or a gas that's used to uh, try to penetrate if the part has a leak in it under pressure. The pressure is vented off and the parts are placed in a detector, again within a specified time limit, and the detector tells you if gas is escaping or a leak is taking place. So to go into a little more detail, I'll recap this slide. Um, in helium leak test, the device is subjected to pressurized helium gas for 2 to 120 hours, depending on your test condition. Following the helium exposure, the part is placed into a mass spectrometer that pulls a hard vacuum on the device and tries to detect helium being pulled out of the part. The failure is indicated when the mass spectrometer detects helium, and it can detect helium molecules, very fine amounts of helium. 
and it's important to state that helium must be escaping from the package leak to be detected. The other method that we were going to talk about is Krypton-85. Similarly, the device is subjected to a vacuum and then a high pressure with Krypton-85 gas, which is a radioactive gas. It can be for minutes up to hours, depending on the package configuration. Following the Krypton-85 exposure, the device is placed in a crystal that's tuned to detect gamma radioactivity. The presence of Krypton gas is detected through the package walls and the package body, so Krypton does not have to escape from a leak to be detected. If it's in the package cavity, the detected crystal will find it. So when I talked about the time could be 2 to 120 hours or minutes to hours, um, the pressurization cycle and the time required for that pressure are determined by the free volume of the cavity device. Currently, the test sensitivity and leak rate rejection are significantly different between mill standard 883 and 750. The criteria for mill standard 750 is significantly tighter than the criteria that's allowed by mill standard 883. But there is current activity in the uh, JEDEC committees and in the government to change the mill standard 883 limits and tighten the limits by magnitudes tighter for fine leak testing. Um, this may um, result in some pieces of equipment that are used to do helium leak detection tests not being able to reach the limits on certain devices. So there are also several other leak test methods and test equipments that are used in the industry um, Minko does not own or operate optical fine leak, CHLB, or any other methods. So that's the reason that this uh, webinar is only addressing helium fine leak testing and krypton fine and gross leak testing. So are there some subtle and some significant differences in the test methodology between helium and krypton testing? When you pressurized parts in the helium test cycle and it's complete and the pressure is reduced, it's just reduced to the room atmosphere. This is a bonus because you're not forcing any of the gas out of the cavity. So if gas was in there, it's going to have to leak out naturally or be pulled out by a vacuum. When the krypton pressure cycle is complete, a vacuum is pulled on the chamber to remove the radioactive gas. Um, this vacuum could evacuate krypton from the device if there's a large enough leak. So I would consider this to be a minus. Um, a lot of people in our industry would say that fine leak testing is a lot easier than gross leak testing because there are more opportunities to miss a gross leak device than there are with a fine leak. In fact, if you tested a part without a lid on it, it would pass fine and gross leak. So very dramatic uh, circumstance, but um, large leaks can vent the gas quickly and not be picked up by the detector. In the detector, the mass spec, helium has to leak out of the part, as I'd said in a previous slide, to be detected. So once you force the helium in there and it goes into the mass spec and it pulls a hard vacuum on the device, it has to effectively pull helium out through the mass spec to detect it. Um, this is a little bit of a negative because the pressure you use to get the gas in there is significantly greater than the pressure you're able to achieve to get the gas out. Krypton does not have to leak. So if you're able to force any molecules of krypton gas into a leak in the package cavity, the detection crystal will see it whether it leaks out or not. And it goes with saying that pressurization cycle times are significantly different between krypton and helium. Again, helium can be um, many, many hours. Um, krypton, very rarely will you see pressurization cycles more than four hours. In many cases, the pressurization cycle with krypton is minutes. So when you're performing a leak test, especially fine leak test, the physics of compressed gas works against you. Um, you're going to rely on gas to escape from a leak to give you the indication that you have a leak. So the pressure differential that's used to put the gas in the cavity is substantially higher than the differential that you could create trying to get it back out. Also, immediately following the seal process, the parts go through a number of tests 
before they get to the leak chamber um, where chemicals, inks, solvents, um, heavy, uh, uh, heavy molecule fluorocarbons come in contact with the part and all of those have the opportunity to mask or even plug the leak path before you're able to detect it. This diagram, the example shows parts that are being sealed in a standard atmosphere chamber. So the chamber is at one atmosphere, the device is at one atmosphere when it's being sealed. Some people seal in air, some seal in nitrogen, some seal with a combination that includes a helium tracer gas. But the pressure differential at the point of seal is zero. When you go to helium or you go to krypton-85 to bomb the parts, to pressurize the parts prior to the detection of uh, leaks, you can bomb up to five atmospheres for the pressurization cycle. So 75 PSIA helium or 75 PSIA kryptone. When again, the package, if it does not leak, is still at one atmosphere. But this creates a pressure differential from one atmosphere to five atmospheres of 60 PSI. So when we go to the test chamber, um, the mill standard tells us that we have to try to pull as close to a perfect vacuum when we're doing the test. So we just give a number here of 0 0.002 atmospheres. The device, again, if it did not leak, is at one atmosphere. But if it does have a leak, um, the pressure differential that you can create from a vacuum to the native pressure that was in the cavity at the most can be 14.6 PSI. That's when you're doing helium test because you pull a vacuum on the part. When you use krypton, it's at equilibrium. There is no vacuum pulled in the krypton chamber when the detection is taking place. So again, you can force the gas into the package at 60 pounds, but you can only ever achieve a differential of 60 or 14 PSI to get the gas back out. The next series of videos, this is uh, the first video here, is the rate meter on the Krypton 85 detector. And this first slide shows background. So there's natural radiation in the background. It comes from cosmic rays in the sun. Um, from natural radiation in our environment and in the earth and in Austin, Texas our background is about 800 counts per minute. So the next slide is a part that passes Krypton 85. The part is in, in, inserted into the detection chamber and we can look and the needle is just bouncing around in the 5 to 800 range so it's still at background. No leak was detected. In this third slide, this is a failing part. The part's inserted. Krypton gas that's in the cavity is detected. We have a counts per minute above 700 uh, or uh, 1700 counts per minute, which is a failure. Parts removed and the chamber returns to 800 counts per minute. So this is a part that has an indication of a leak, but it doesn't fail the test. The requirement to fail the test is 1,800 counts per minute, and this part only achieves 14 to 15. We'll talk about this part a little bit later. This is a helium mass spec detector. Again, this is a passing part. The machine counts up and then begins to do the test sequence, and it counts down pass the part and it continues to count down, driving the count to negative 8 and if I hadn't cut the video off it goes all the way down to negative 10. So this is definitely a passing part. This is a failing part in the helium detector. And we can see that helium is seeping out of the package and it's being detected by the machine and the machine is, is constant. But just like Krypton, there are some parts that pass, but don't pass very uh, strong. And this is a part. It counts down to 10 to the negative 7th, and it holds. It doesn't continue to count down. So this part, although it passes the test limit, it has a fine leak. 
So the indication of pass fail is different on each piece of equipment that you use to do test. Measurable leak um, on uh, or a measurable leak indication is necessary to determine hermetic, non-hermetic, and borderline. So you have to be able to see the gauge or see the dial. Some older machines, all they have is a red light and a green light. So you punch the button to do the test, and the light is red, and if it passes, it turns green. Or if it's bad, it stays red. But it doesn't give you indication of how good or how bad the part is. So I would have concern with a tester that only gives me a single indicator. I think I would prefer to be able to look at the gauge and tell whether the part is a solid pass, a solid fail, or a borderline pass. So the two parts that we saw in the previous videos, this would be the question of the day. What do you do with those parts? Um, you've tested them. They pass the test, but they, you know that they leak. They have a leak in them. So the middle standard would say that part is acceptable, but a reputable assembly site would say this part has a leak and I don't think that I can send that to my customer. So near hermetic parts get detected in both methods. Um, they pass the hermetesty test. They were tested using two different test methods. Both give an indication leak, but don't fail. But the thing that will happen is if that part were used to do residual gas analysis test, um, you would fail RGA. You would find helium or possibly fluorocarbon or atmosphere inside that part. There's also a phenomenon called one-way leak, and I mentioned it in my introduction. Um, and we see those, they're detected using the Krypton method. You can take a part that has a one-way leak and test it in the helium tester and it passes. It passes with no problem at all. But it fails with the Krypton tester. And again, the reason for that is, is the helium has to leak out in order to be tested by, be detected by the mass spec, but the krypton can be seen through the package. Those parts will fail internal gas analysis and typically will have evidence of helium or atmosphere in them. And uh, no matter what method you use, it's very difficult to force evacuate the package. Once you get the material in there, once you get the krypton in there or the helium in there, the only way to get that back out is punch a hole in the package. So we mentioned RGA, or residual gas analysis test, and I don't think you can have a reasonable conversation about hermeticity without talking about RGA just a little bit. RGA is the uh, ultimate judge of whether a part is hermetic or non-hermetic. Uh, unfortunately, you can't do RGA on 100% of your parts because that test is destructive. Um, but there are many recorded instances in the microelectronics devices in our industry where parts were thought to be hermetic, but they fail the internal gas analysis test, and they contain atmosphere, helium, fluorocarbons, moisture, and sometimes organics. So at Minco, uh, once this question was raised, we reviewed a, re a residual gas analysis database that spanned the years from 2010 to 2014 and covered two, 382 tested devices. All of these parses were sealed in a 99.9 percent .9 nitrogen dry atmosphere. In that data, we were able to find 14 of the 382 parts had helium in them. <clears throat> Seven of those 14 passed the 5,000 ppm limit for moisture. Also, we had 12 of the 382 that had indications of fluorocarbons in them. Six pass 5,000 ppm and six have an argon to oxygen ratio that's near 20 to 1, which is breathing air. That's the atmosphere you and I are breathing right now. So those parts are leakers, but they pass the RGA spec. So you have to consider the size of the leak path that we're talking about. If you're talking about a leak with a 5 times 10 to the negative 8 or smaller leak rate, this is a molecular leak path. It's not something you're going to see with a microscope. You're not going to see it with a sim. Um, this, is a, this is a leak path that is uh, infinitely small and would be difficult to see regardless of the tool that you used. So why do you have parts that pass leak test but in the future fail your residual gas analysis? Well, the, the parts have become plugged. The leak path has become obstructed. So you have liquid contaminants, <clears throat> fluorocarbons, oils, flux from soldering, ambient moisture in the air, <clears throat> ink 
from your marking process or clean cleaners, ink cleaners. You can also have corrosion. Um, the weld region of a header corrodes rapidly when it's exposed to the open air. It's made of iron, um, Kovar is, so corrosion forms rapidly when it's exposed to the air. And there are also some items that talk about that the flexing of the package materials can open leak paths that then when the part is not under pressure, that uh, flex is relieved and the path reseals itself. So past RGA indicators um, indicates that passing leakers and one-way leakers existed for quite some time. Um, most of the experience that I speak of is experience in glass to metal seal um, feed-through packages. We haven't observed any of these one-way leaks in flat packs, dips, or leadless chip carrier packages. And also not headers, canned headers, TO5s and TO18s with full glass filled bases. So really parts are hermetic or non-hermetic. They leak or they don't. So um, testing can indicate the presence of leak um, even if the result is acceptable to the mil-spec limits. You need to be aware of that. Um, the upcoming revision to 883 tightens the test limits but still does not address near hermetic devices. So even with the tightened limits, you'll still find parts that leak um, just below the, or just above the acceptable limit. And one-way leak devices um, exist, and our experience is that Krypton 85 allows the detection of the, crap, uh, the trapped gases without the presence of an active leak. Again, once you get that Krypton inside that cavity, even if it becomes plugged or obstructed, you can still see it with the detector. It does not have to leak out. Fluorocarbon plugging, corrosion, contamination from solder fluxes, inks, all of those things can plug leaks or create one-way leaks and may result in an RGA failure or an indication of a leak without a failure in future testing. So here at Minco, we're currently performing a study on three groups of parts. Um, the parts are leak test failures that have Krypton 85 trapped inside of them. The initial detection of this trapped gas was made in 2011. Um, current indication is the parts still have Krypton 85 inside the cavity. They've never been subjected to the Krypton 85 exposure or activation one time since uh, 2011. Since 2011, the parts have been subjected to over 30 vacuum pressure cycles to try to pump the parts and remove the Krypton-85, and it has not been successful. And if you measure and calculate the Krypton-85 rejection rate, it's currently tracking at the half-life decay of Krypton-85. So it says that that Krypton um, from 2011 to today has not leaked out a single molecule, and we're measuring the decay of the radioactivity in the base material. So is one-way leak a new issue? No, it's uh, been around quite some time. There are a number of publications out there that discuss it and talk about it all the way back from uh, 1973. Um, there's been a number of scenarios proposed and discussed, but there's been no single um, item ever indicated or isolated as being the cause of a one-way leak. And uh, my opinion is that it's likely that one-way leaks have existed since the beginning of hermetic packaging, and it's just that now there is better technology and more data that's allowing us to demonstrate that it's present. So my definition of a one-way leak is a part that's been subjected to the hermetic test. It admits the bombing or detection gas or fluid into the package cavity, but does not admit the gas during the detection cycle and may retain the bombing gas until it's detected via an alternate test method or a later date, being Krypton-85 testing or RGA sampling. So the two dominant phenomena that are seen in these leakers are um, known leakers that are contaminated with fluorocarbon, um, seen as one-way leaks uh, when performing the hermeticity testing. Parts that are plugged um, during the pressurization cycle, maybe particles in the gas media um, from the leak sites or oxidation such as rust in the seal area. And then the gas that is used in the helium test, helium gas, has the lowest solubility in fluorocarbon of all the inert gases 
So even though you're performing a pressurization cycle on a part, if it's been subjected to fluorocarbon, there's fluorocarbon in the leak path, it's least likely that helium will make it in or that the helium that does make it in will be of a very low concentration and may be too low to be detected by the mass spectrometer when it's coming back out. And for some of those items, uh, these are the references. Um, people that have written books and have written white papers that discuss um, leak rate, gas analysis, and one-way leaking uh, phenomena in our industry. A couple of names which might actually be listening in on this webinar right now. So the other half of uh, the leak test picture is gross leak. And it is exactly what it sounds like. And that is uh, fine leak is looking for fine leaks or very small leaks. Gross leak is looking for a larger leak. Um, you do fine leak before you do gross leak. Some would think, well, I want to look for the big leaks first and then the small leaks second. But most of the gross leak testing is done with a liquid, um, with the exception of the combination tests and the helium tests that allow you to do gross fine combinations. Um, gross leak is done with a uh, fluorocarbon or it's done with a red dye. If you flood the package with the, the fluorocarbon or the red dye and then you try to do fine leak afterwards, you cannot compress a fluid and so you would not be able to get the gas inside the cavity. So that's the purpose of doing fine leak before you do gross leak. And so both fluorocarbon and red dye testing require the devices be immersed in liquid um, there's a vacuum cycle and then a pressure cycle. And then the um, escaping fluids after the pressurization cycle are either made um, by a reaction with an indicator fluid or in the case of red dye, the parts begin to bleed, red dye. And you can pick it up, um, see it on the surface of the package. And I do have some illustrations of that. The unfortunate side of gross leak is they can plug fine leaks. So this is a video of some TO3 headers that you can see with the uh, bubbles coming out of the lead area. Um, obviously these are gross leakers, but you can see the bubbles being admitted um, right around the leads where they go into the package body. Likewise, these are some TO258 packages that are leaking in the corners due to a poor welding setup. This part is a, a device that's been subjected to the red dye test. You can see the picture of the before and after. The parts were subjected to the red dye pressurization then they were pulled from the red dye, they were cleaned up, and then they were set on a table and they allowed to uh, begin to start bleeding. So you can see the red that's bleeding around between the lead where it inserts through the glass. Here, although it's a very small indication, if you can see my mouse, you can see red dye coming out through this seal right here. And in the alternate picture, you can see red dye actually coming right through the glass. It's not a leak in the glass to the body. It's not a leak in the glass to the lead. But it's a leak that's coming straight through the glass feed-through. Here's some additional um, lead feed-throughs that are showing red dye. Some obvious indications of red dye bleeding through between the lead and the glass feed-through. So what this says is, for the package that you have and the product that you're testing, choose the best test method. Choose the test method that's going to give you the best result with the greatest resolution for the product type that you need to test. So you need to understand the specification, understand the limits and the limitations of the equipment and the test that you're using. Uh, be aware of the potential for gross leak escapes, one-way leaks, and the possibility of plugged leak paths. Uh, keep up to date with the changing mill standards and the tightening limits. Um, both leak test and RGA test are both currently under evaluation and both of them are going to be tightened. 
The leak test rate will be tightened significantly, and the internal gas analysis will now not only have rejections for 5,000 ppm of moisture, but it will also include the rejection criteria for the presence of fluorocarbon, for helium, and for atmosphere. That represents a 20 to 1 ratio, which would mean that you have um, breathing air inside your package. There will be exceptions for certain types of packages that are sealed in dry air. So the tests that are currently performed by MINCO um, are the ones that were listed at the beginning of this uh, webinar. And that is we have uh, 883 methods, method 1014, A1, and A2, which are the helium fine leak tests. Method 1014, B1, B2, and the B2, B1, Krypton 85. One, and one is fine leak, and the other one is fine gross combo. We also do 1014 condition C1, which is the fluorocarbon gross leak. Our current recommendation on this test is that Krypton is more reliable and has a greater level of sensitivity of those three test methods. In 750, although we are, um, we've seen a copy of our approval letter, but we haven't seen the signed letter, MINCO within the next few days will be approved as a DLA approved lab for the performance of 750 test, method 1071 Krypton, A, the wet gross, B, Krypton dry gross, G1, which is the Krypton fine test, and again, G2, another fine test. And so again, there at the bottom of the slide, our opinion is, is that Krypton testing, it is much more reliable, it's more sensitive, and the time uh, required to perform the test, especially on large cavity devices, is significantly shorter than the helium test. And at the bottom of the slide, um, if you have not seen the proposed changes to MIL standard 883 or 750, you can email me at uh, those email addresses and I can forward you a copy of the red line document from the DLA. Uh, I can also submit you a copy of the comparison document, the list of changes. Again, in the fine leak document, it is significant. The uh, helium fine leak document, the changes are significant. So I have a couple of questions here. One is from Brian and it's um, to determine if the Krypton 85 is inside the package or on the surface. There is a factor in Krypton 85 called surface absorption or surface absorption. And that is if you have a part that has a lot of surface covering, uh, ink, adhesives, conformal coatings. In some cases, um, with the helium or the krypton, the uh, materials on the surface will hold that gas. So there is a way of classifying parts and qualifying them to determine whether the krypton is on the surface or not. Um, our leak detector, our krypton leak detector, there is a surface detector that is part of the equipment. It's this small device off to the side. If you have a conformal coating or a large amount of ink marking on the parts, we can pull the part out of the bomb and place this detector on the surface of the package and it will tell us if there is krypton. Um, we, can, we can determine if there's krypton on the surface. Again, if there's krypton inside the cavity, it would see that in the crystal, not in the surface detector. So, um, so we're able to do that and it is, it is something that has to be taken into consideration. We're doing parts that have large amounts of glass surfaces, a lot of ink, or there are parts that um, may have residual fluxes or anything else on anything that can hold a molecule of krypton can probably hold a molecule of helium also. So we have to be aware of that. This package is a TO3, standard TO3, two pin. And this package is a TO258, um, three lead package. And these photos, this is a photo of a package that is a lead feed through on a TO257, similar to the 258, but smaller. And these packages are TO257s also. I have a question from Todd. Will there be a hydrogen limit in the RGA spec? I believe there will be. Um, I can look that up here while I answer a couple more questions. Another question from Brian, is there a time limit after red dye procedure to grossly test? Um, 
you know, it's uh, let me just say that that using the red dye process is a little bit of an art. Um, you bomb the parts and you pressurize them with the red dye. Then you bring off the pressure and you rinse the parts off with acetone so they're clean. And then you look for them to bleed after that, after the surface cleanup, because they're coated with this red dye. And they do, uh, they do begin to bleed out. Um, and on the demonstrations and some of the slides, the training slides, you see that they use a very bright white cloth or a towel and they lay the parts down there and then they look to see if the parts bleed out red spots. Our experience has been on these uh, glass feed-through packages that you can see the red dye as it seeps back out through the leak path. Um, but also you have to remember that a part is a gross leak in order to do this. You could never force the molecule of the red dye and its combination of mineral oil and, and the other components that make up the red dye. You could never force that material into a fine leak path. So these parts would only be um, gross leak paths that you would see. And if you had a very large hole in the package and you rinsed it off, obviously when you move the package around, you'd see the red dye pouring out of the part. Whether hydrogen was going to be a part of the new test method, um, I've got the 1014 document and I have the 1018 document I've just opened up. And um, it'll take me just a second to get to that part in the document to see what the primary gases are that are going to now be in the rejection criteria. Okay, so the new spec says maximum allowable water, maximum allowable water vapor content is 5,000 ppm. The allowable oxygen content other than 10,000 ppm. Fluorocarbon 50 ppm other gas contents that represent a failure. But there is a passive criteria written into the document also, um, not in the rejection criteria, but in the performance portion of the stack that mentions oxygen-argon ratios of 20 to 1. I would assume that in the activity of the task group, that's either going to be asked to be removed as a part of the performance and put down as an accept reject criteria or removed altogether. Okay, first question. Um, this comes from Lee. Um, are red dye failures concerned by opening the package and seeing if the red dye is inside? Um, we have had to do that in a couple of the parts that we've done. We know we have a leak and we have uh, performed the red dye test but we were unable to get the red dye to bleed back out um, even after several cycles. Um, so we went ahead and delitted the part and we could see red dye inside the package after the delitting. So um, if, the, if, the, if the leak is present um, and you're doing failure analysis, yes, but our experience is, is that not every part will bleed the dye back out. I'm told I have one more question coming. And one more question from Brian is, why do LCC pass red dye and pass wet gross leak and then bleed red dye after 72 hours or longer, like a week? Um, I'm not sure. Um, we've not had that experience, um, so I can't say that it's, it's possible or not possible. Uh, like it, and, and I guess this kind of enforces what I said in the in the webinar, is that fine leak testing seems to be a lot easier than gross leak testing. There's a lot more variables in gross leak testing to the point that you can totally have a test escape. You can totally miss a gross leak part. Um, an example would be possibly a welded or a solder sealed part that has a very large gap in the weld ring. Um, maybe a third of the way around the cavity, you have a gap in the weld ring. Um, if you put the part in a helium fine leak tester and then bring it out and do your dwell and put it in your um, mass spec, all the helium has possibly gotten away. The exact same thing could happen with krypton. The leak, the hole is big enough that the gas gets away before you have time to test it. Um, if you do a wet method, um, if you do a, a, a fluorocarbon method, um, it's possible that hole could be big enough that 
that, um, you would see one large bubble and mistake that for a bubble that could have been trapped under the device. Or the floor carbon, uh, depending on the cavity size, the floor carbon could have cooked away um, because it's very hot when it comes out of the bath. The, uh, the indicator fluid um, could cook away and, and you would not see um, that leak. And uh, last but not least, in red dye, um, you could rinse away the red dye. If, they, if the gap were that large, you could rinse the red dye away while you're doing the acetone wash and not have anything to find. Um, it has not been our experience, and I would have to say we have not done red dye tests on, on any LCCs here. Um, so, Brian, I don't know that I can fully answer your question. Um, there, but it would be very interesting to uh, look at those parts and try to understand the leak path and why it would take so long for the red dye to come back out of the package. Okay, last question, Todd. As the hydrogen phenomena, base metal hydrogen entrapment. Um, and, and, you know, Todd, I kind of agree with you. There was a book that was written by um, Philip Schusler many, many years ago when he was at IBM and he talked about the amount of hydrogen that's trapped in the gold, in the gold plating on packages, and that uh, with no devices in the cavity, um, packages could be sealed up, gold packages could be sealed up, subjected to a number of environmental screens, and the hydrogen count inside the package would increase dramatically. And, uh, and the, the conclusion for that is that it was coming out of the gold during the um, thermal and mechanical exercises. So uh, there's been a couple of other exercises. Um, so you know, hydrogen is an indicator, and it is an atmospheric gas, but there's also the strong possibility that if you have large gold-plated components, substrates, or large gold traces inside the package or your gold-plated lid, that some of that, gold, some of that hydrogen could be native to the materials, the test materials. And it's possible that, that if you and want to eliminate it, then you probably need to run some evaluations or qualifications to determine how much hydrogen is being produced by your native materials so that you could separate that from the possibility of a leak. Again, in the new, uh, new RGA standard, um, hydrogen is not addressed. So, okay, I think that's it. Um, I appreciate everybody's attendance. Uh, thank you for being here, and I hope this was of some benefit. I know we didn't cover all the test methods, but uh, I have no experience in uh, continuous leak detection or optical leak detection, so I would encourage the people who are the subject matter experts for those, um, I would encourage you to get information out to educate our community on the pluses and minuses, the benefits, the strong points and the weak points of those test methods. Thank you again and I appreciate your attendance. For more information about Minko Technology Labs, visit www.minkotech.com.